Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you all here, and welcome to St. Macker's Ron Farley Church. An extra warm welcome to visitors today. Uh, we have um, Stephanie or Stephanie and uh, Fabian, who are hoping to get married sometime next year. Uh, so they're just coming along to have a wee chat after the service and to join us for worship this morning. And also, um, my brother and his his offspring and his wife are here. <laughs> Uh, so we will be learning a few Dutch words because there's now uh, a number of Dutch people in, in the service. So uh, we'll do that later during the old age talk. Before, um, I, I don't really have that many other announcements, but Dave has asked if he could come forward to tell us a bit um, about Christian Aid. So we'll have to watch a really short video and then Dave will do his plug. be Christian Aid Week coming up. For some of us, preparing for Christian Aid Week started in March, but for everybody else it's May. Um, if you go on the next slide, I used to, this is a, a poster from several years ago and I just thought this poster was fantastic. So this girl's saying, going door to door so that someone in a slum uh, in Kenya can change their life is amazing to me. And I used to think that actually summed up Christian Aid Week for us in Bridge of Weir. <clears throat> now, sadly, it's not quite so much the case now. We used to have about 45 volunteers between ourselves, Freeland, and I think St Mary's used to do stuff as well, to go around door to door. But when we, looked, when we asked for people this year, there was barely a handful. So what we've had to do, if you go on to the next slide, we've had to... Um, try for the first time, resort to what's called delivery only envelopes, which means you don't have to go back and ask for the envelope and ask for money to be put in and everything like that. So it's delivery only envelopes. Now, every one of the envelopes has a sticker on it saying, if you want to give by cash, please either drop it back at one of the churches or take it to the bridge. And because people have been used to us coming back, there's an insert note in each of the envelopes, again, saying if you want to give in cash, that's what to do with it. But probably a better way to donate is through the online envelope. So there's a dedicated Bridge of Weir e-envelope, as they call it, so that any money that's put in through that goes directly to Christian Aid, but it gets counted against the amount of money raised by Bridge of Weir in Christian Aid Week. So... First thing I need to do is to, I'll just say, I mean, obviously I was a bit disappointed that there weren't many volunteers willing to go and do the actual house to house and the collection. But I've been coaching myself for the last few weeks to be positive about it. And actually what I should do is thank everybody for all the years in the past that they've done it. Because it's been a huge commitment by people. And if you want to give yourselves a pat on the back, I did some quick calculations the other day. I've I mean, I came into Bridge of Weir 41 years ago. I think I've been delivering envelopes for about 40 years. But I only recent, only in the last 15 years took on the responsibility of trying to organise it, which has been a nightmare, but no, it's been good. Um, we've complemented the house-to-house -house collections by various other things, and some of the boys did a, a BB boys did the kilt walk the other year, and that was fantastic. But door-to-door -door collections has been the biggest contribution we've done every single year has been the biggest for the last I think it's actually now the last 14 years if you want to give yourself a pat on the back the total sum raised by Bridge of Weir for Christian Aid is over £90,000 so better than a poke in the eye of a sharp stick so thank you for doing that it's delivery only envelopes um, 
I'm, I want to thank everybody who's already agreed to do a street or a combination of streets. There are still, I think, five we've got here that are looking for a home, five streets. Thornwood Drive, Barassi Drive, um, St Andrews Drive, 50 plus, but we may have a home for that one. Um, Earl Place and I think Glengowan Road and Thistlebank. So after the service, if you could agree to do one of those streets, combination of streets, that would be great. Please come and see me either at the back or down here at the coffee, coffee table. Um, that's basically it. I, if I can hold you for another minute, I, I came across um, an idea in a completely different context. It was actually to do a training for a bicycle race um, about the power of changing just one letter in a three letter word. Just change the middle letter. So it's very easy to think, oh, if I get these envelopes, I've got to go and deliver them on Friday or Saturday. Oh, I've got to prepare the sermon for today. Oh, how am I going to do that? Oh, I've got to look after the grandchildren on Tuesday. If you change the middle letter of got into get, it changes everything. Oh, I get to look after the grandchildren on Tuesday afternoon. Oh, I get to write this sermon. Oh, I get to deliver Christian Aid envelopes. If you see that one up there, Christian Aid Week is the biggest single Christian witness activity in the UK every year. So you get to be a part of it. So be positive. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. The invitation to come into worship, come into God's presence. Leave behind worries, leave behind cares. Leave behind prejudice and preference. Come to God who accepts all, who receives all and who loves all. Come and worship our surprising God. We're going to sing together uh, a hymn that's really a psalm, hymn 61, O oh, sing a new song to the Lord.
Let us pray. God of our dreams, you shake us up and you change the way we think and act. You do all of this through our dreams, through the new things that we learn, through friends and strangers telling it as it is, through our reading and our viewing, through our neighbours and our workmates, in our worship time, our Bible readings, and in our prayer time, you speak to us. You reveal yourself to us and you make your ways known to us. So we praise you for not giving up on us, for not keeping us as we are, but by renewing us, refocusing us, and turning us around to accept that your ways are better than our ways, that your world is bigger than our world, and that the Spirit of God is able to change our understandings, our worldviews, our cultural understandings, and our limited life experiences into something fresh, wholesome, and wonderful. God of our dreams, forgive us when we fail to grasp your will at work in our lives. Forgive us when we are puzzled by your challenges and afraid to step out. Forgive us when we believe that things should always be done in only one way. Forgive us when we refuse to accept your words and believe that we knew what was best for us. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Forgive our lack of confidence, our lack of trust, our lack of vision, and bring us to a deeper sense of your peace and your understanding that our lives can be made new in you and our sins forgiven. We ask all of these things in the name of Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever. Amen. Now, since we have uh, a number of Dutch people among us today, and obviously quite a number of Scottish people, and quite possibly some uh, other people from other countries too, and the story is, in a way, about people from all nations coming together in Jesus' church, I thought we should do a little language lesson. So if I can have um, some slides up. Now, it sounds intimidating. Apparently, Dutch is one of the hardest languages to learn. But surprisingly, or perhaps unsurprisingly, there are a number of Scottish words that are really quite uh, similar and have links to Dutch words, obviously other languages too. But uh, I've picked out a few which I think should be a good entry, uh, entry lesson. Fred will keep me right as well in the <laughs> choir. So, um, done them two ways, but we'll, we'll see the first word and see. So, this is a Dutch word. Uh, it's house. I'm sure you could guess what that might be. House. Yeah, and if we were saying it's Scottish, how would we say it? <laughs> yeah, it, it's getting closer, you see. I'm going to try the Dutch pronunciation once more, though, because it is a bit tricky. House. House. The ow sound is quite tricky. House. Okay. So. So the Scottish word is hoose. Right, one very similar, I'm sure you can guess this one as well. Mouse. Mouse. Yeah, so what are we talking about? A moose, yeah. <laughs> so moose, can we see the moose? Yep. 
What is the, what, what's that? What's that? What's that? The mouse. Peep, peep. Yeah, the Dutch mouse says peep peep. <laughs> in case you were wondering, those are there are quite a, a number of distinctions in the actual sounds that animals make. We haven't got pig, but the Dutch pig says knor knor. Just, <laughs> just uh, relating it. Right. What's the next one? Well, this is a Scottish word, so it's coo. Now, Eric, what is a coo? Coo. What do you think it is? What's that? The coo. Boo, yeah, Dutch cows are really scary, they say boo. Uh, <laughs> but, so the Scottish word coo is very similar to what we say in the Netherlands, which is coo. So again, it's uh, closer than, than the English even. Another one? Ooh, this one's interesting. So the Scottish word, you say it to me, mer, mer, yeah. And that's the Dutch, and I'm going to let you guess, what do you think it is? Meer, yeah, excellent. So more. Uh, the Dutch word is meer. You say that? Meer. meer. It's also the word for lake, confusingly, but here I meant it to be more. Yeah? That meer. <laughs> that one. Okay, next one. Uh, that's a Dutch word again. Out. It's another ou sound. What do we think it is? And in Scottish? Oot. <laughs> yeah? You get the next one? So, again, Scottish is, nearly, is closer than the English word for it. Right, next one. Oh, this is easy. This is a Dutch one. Yeah, and how are we going to pronounce it in Dutch, do you think? Kerek. Kerek. And, Tabitha, what's the Scottish word for Kerek? You know, the English word. Yeah, right. Give us the Scottish word then. Kirk. Yeah, so it's really close. Uh, I don't know if I, I have one funny word, I think. Yeah, this is the guess. <laughs> okay, doodle sock. Any guesses? Uh, oh, you know, very good. Remember doodle sock? What was it? Talked about it in the car. It was an entertaining word. So <laughs> keep us going on the way to Loch Lomond. Doodle sock. So that's bagpipes. I think that was all I had this morning. <laughs> I honestly, doodle doesn't mean anything in Dutch either, as my husband asked. It's just, I guess, the sound. Uh, and that says, goed gedaan, means well done. Now, we're going to sing a song about being the church and that everyone is part of the church, no matter our age, no matter our color, uh, where we're from. So that's, um, I am the church, we are the church. Uh, possibly, yes, in that order. Uh, I am the church, you are the church. There are actions, feel free. If you're feeling creative, you can join in. Um, I think I've taken the third verse out of the, so one, two, four, and five. Do you want the instruments? I'm sure you do.
I knew this is the cruel part. Uh, we'd be jingling all the way. If we so, <laughs> Philip, Philip is going to, we've been reading in the book of Acts of the Apostles. Uh, last week we had our all age service and Philip was running, not this Philip, <laughs> Philip the Apostle was running along the chariot of the, of the um, Ethiopian uh, eunuch to catch up and to tell him, explain to him the scriptures he was reading and to welcome him into the people of God. This week we will hear how Peter has to open his mind as to who all is uh, welcome in the church and we will hear about Cornelius, a Roman centurion who lived in Caesarea by the sea. So we're going to be reading initially Acts 10 verses 1 to 8, then the choir will sing the anthem and then we have, we skip sort of bit to the end of the story, so the chapter is quite long uh, but it is a good story, 34, verses 34 to 38 and 44 to 48. So. Uh, Philip knows what he's doing and you can just read along. <laughs> At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Reg Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come to a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring them back. A man called Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of the servants and a devout soldier who was one of the servants, who was one of the attendants. He told them everything that happened and sent them to Joppa.
Then Peter began to speak. I now realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism, but accept from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace throughout Jesus. Though Jesus, who is Lord of all, you know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee. After the baptism that John preached and how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came out on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who came had come, had come with Peter were at, astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured, poured out on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the very way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked Peter to stay with him for a few days. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading from his holy word. Thank you, Philip. So, um, yeah, as we've just heard, the, the Jewish, fresh Jewish Christians, they were so amazed that the Holy Spirit had now also been given to the Gentiles. Uh, and then on the basis of that, the, they were... Um, Baptized. Last week we learned a new song about baptism, uh, bapti baptized by water, and we're just going to sing it again because uh, it will help us to remember it for the future. So that's hymn 636, Baptized in Water. <coughs> successor on the AV desk I see good his dad does it at home as well but anyway might be in the jeans hopefully <laughs> friends uh, I may be gonna get the uh, picture of um, Lois one of the interesting news stories at least from a Christian perspective this week uh, in, the, in the headlines was that Russell Brand was baptized in the River Thames last Sunday or so he announced um, on this YouTube channel. He was baptised and leaving aside if immersion in the Thames is a wise choice from a health point of view, his baptism has certainly caught the attention of the media and commentators of various backgrounds. Wikipedia describes him as an English comedian, actor, presenter, activist and campaigner. 
He became more widely famous uh, in 2004 after being in the Big Brother house, which at the time I think is still watched, but well, long given up. Um, it would be fair to say that he is an acquired taste and a very controversial figure. If you followed his antics at all, then you may know that uh, he's a recovering drug and sex addict by his own uh, admission, and last autumn, um, five women have made allegations of sexual assault by him. He has denied those allegations, but that's still rumbling on. He is a very controversial figure, and now it seems that he's gone from being a Buddhist to converting to Christianity. Now, what Christians should make of his conversion is an interesting question. We may think it's great that such a public figure openly converts to Christianity, but many people have questions too, and understandably so. Is his conversion genuine? Is he just doing this for attention or as another route for spiritual fulfillment? If it is that, that he's just looking for greater spiritual fulfillment, that may be a good thing. If we do believe that knowing God in Jesus is the only thing that brings true peace and light in our life, then sure, it's there for Russell Brand as well. But baptism is also about repentance and starting afresh, especially for adults. So is there any evidence that Brand has repented his past life and his behaviours towards others. I hope and trust that whoever has prepared Brand for his baptism has taken their time to disciple him and to teach him. And I guess time will tell if there is evidence of renewal in his life and his ways. Okay, I think we can uh, get rid of him now. <laughs> <laughs> not, that, not that way, that's definitely too harsh. Just mean his picture. Um, anyway, why I mentioned it this morning is because he is an example of a seemingly unlikely person to discover or rediscover Christianity and to convert. While we here in the church are often deeply overwhelmed and discouraged by how secular and anti religious our society has become and how disinterested so many people around us seem to be in coming to church or knowing anything about God or Christianity, perhaps the tide is turning. And perhaps the church needs to play catch up with what God is doing outside these walls. Russell Brand isn't the only famous person that's turning towards God. The psychologist and public thinker Jordan Peterson, also controversial uh, to a degree, but he has long been exploring the Bible as a sort of moral, from a sort of moral interest point of view. He explores particularly the Old Testament stories and um, kind of tries to set out how there can be uh, a guide for living and how they, and a lot of uh, young men in particular are really interested in what he's got to say. He see, but he personally seems to be mo moving slowly towards a more explicit faith in the God of Christianity. I read an article uh, on Thursday in the papers that argued that while belief in God among baby boomers is still falling, Millennials are bending the knee to religion. More and more younger influencers and sports figures are willing to profess a faith and practice it publicly. This undermines the assumption that secularism is inevitable and that it will before long wipe out all religious faith. The actual demographic trends do not hold that up. Of course, not everyone is converting to Christianity. People are drawn to other faiths too, like Buddhism and Islam and Judaism, and for varying reasons. 
But it is entirely possible that while we are absorbed with endless church reorganization, a narrative of decline and much navel-gazing, we're missing that the mood outside is changing. And we may need to play catch-up with a greater interest in religion, a greater openness to God among younger generations. The passage we read this morning from Acts of the Apostles is another great story. And here we read how Peter and the Jewish Christian church had to play catch up with God, what God was doing in the life of Gentiles. That's how they would refer to non Jews. Up to this point, the mission of the apostles had focused on telling their fellow Jews the news that Jesus had been raised from the dead and was thus proved to be the Messiah. They had at this point, so this is the apostles, they had moved out of Jerusalem and the immediate area around it of Judea. Philip, as we heard last week, had moved into Samaria and Peter was now uh, in Joppa. And in this story, he uh, meets someone from Caesarea by the coast. This week, a Rome, uh, last week we heard how Philip had a remarkable encounter with a man from Ethiopia, a eunuch chancellor. And it led to the man's baptism. We don't have his name, unfortunately. This week, a Roman centurion, an army officer, had a vision sent from God as we've heard, Cornelius sees an angel who tells him to go fetch Simon, also known as Peter, in Joppa. And we hear about Cornelius that he was a devout and a God-fearing man, and that he prayed regularly. However, he wasn't a Jew, of course. And I explained last week that those foreigners or Gentiles who weren't born a Jew but were attracted to its religion would often be called God-fearers. So maybe that was Cornelius. He was attracted to the Jewish religion, but probably would not be seen by one of them as one of them. In any case, he worked in the oppressor's armed forces, so there would be little love lost between the Romans and the Jews, of course. But God now has given Cornelius a vision and he is to find Peter, who he probably has never even heard of. God is going to reveal himself to Cornelius through the ministry and the message of Peter. Cornelius is going to hear about Jesus and how God has made himself known to the world through Jesus. Isn't that an amazing thing to think about. God is drawing people to Jesus before the church even realizes that this is the case or before the church has done anything about it. God goes his own way with people. And yes, God works through the ministry of the church, but God isn't wholly dependent on the church on us or our witness. God is already at work in the lives of people in ways that we cannot conceive. Now we've left a big chunk out of the chapter, uh, the biggest chunk in the middle in our readings. Three years ago I um, preached on that. It's a strange vision that Peter has simultaneously to Cornelius' vision of a sheet being lowered from heaven and all sorts of animals crawling in the sheet or the sail and then a voice saying kill it and eat it and the types of animals that were in the sheet were animals that jews weren't allowed to eat so peter then in his vision said in his dream state says no i won't eat it because i'm not allowed to eat that and then three times that command to kill and eat is repeated and when peter wakes up or comes to his senses he realizes that god is trying to tell him something and as he wakes up, the doorbell goes, and it's the servants from Cornelius coming to, to ask Peter to come 
and meet with Cornelius. Uh, I've gone off piste, so now we need to try and find where I am. <laughs> so it's a really weird story to us, but for Peter, uh, it helps to realize that God is doing things kind of beyond his normal cultural boundaries and that God is pushing the boat out. And now he is invited to come and have table fellowship to eat with a Gentile, which is something that devout Jews would not do. They wouldn't actually have food with uh, Gentiles that, because of their purity laws. So this is what happens. Peter is welcomed into Cornelius' house and eats with him and all his relatives and friends that Cornelius has gathered around. And then Peter asks, why has Cornelius sent for him? And Cornelius then tells him about the, about the vision that he had received and that they are now ready to hear what God has to say to them through Peter. To me, there's a message there for the church. God is already at work in the lives of people that are not in the church. But when they somehow cross our paths, we need to be ready to share about Jesus and God with them. They do need us to share what we know, like Philip hopped into the Chancellor's chariot and helped him to understand what he was reading and related to Jesus. Now it's Peter's turn to share the good news. And Peter begins his sermon or his talk saying, I realize now how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. And then he uses that as a way in to talk about Jesus and, and how he comes to bring peace and how he is Lord of all. Now I find this story both encouraging and challenging. It's encouraging because it reminds us that never mind the state of the church or the organized church, God still works in the lives of people. And God still stirs up a longing for more of something that draws people to God. But it's also challenging because as a church we're often not aware or not ready to do our job, to come alongside, to share, to be open. The thing is, which is something the early church struggled with too, is that we tend to prefer to keep things the way we know it and with the people that we already know. We are missing whole generations in the church, but the reality is if they were all here, things would be different. And there may be aspects of that change which we would find hard to stomach. Or maybe we would want to measure those new people, those new members, by what we think it means to be a church member and what our commitment looks like. It certainly took a real mind shift for the early Jewish Christians to fully embrace the Gentile Christians and figure out whether they still needed to be circumcised, for example, and if they needed to keep the religious food laws and other uh, laws of the Torah. And then there were big cultural and language issues too. God's expansion plan wasn't simple or straightforward on the ground, but as Peter had discovered, God does not show favoritism, but accepts everyone from every nation who fears him and does what is right. The church with a capital C was always intended to be a melting pot of nationalities, cultures, languages, and generations. Our local churches should at least be a reflection of, what, of that diversity and inclusivity. So if this is what God is working towards, how can we be ready to embrace those he sends on our path. We need to forego prior judgment and keep our eyes, our ears, and our hearts open with expectancy. This is the exciting mission of God in our world. Let us be ready for it and play our part. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn about the Holy Spirit, 
O breath of life, come sweeping through us. That's hymn 595. pray. God, we thank and praise you that you are still at work in the lives of people inside and outside our churches. Even when we maybe think that all of our society is secular and nobody is interested in God or Jesus any longer, that this is not true. God, if it's true that the tide is turning, that younger generations are looking for more, for you, help us to be ready to engage with them. Help us to be ready to share what we know of you, Jesus. And help us not to be focusing on how they may think or act different from us, but how you long to bring them into your family. Lord Jesus, we pray for your church in these times of change, when it would be easy to become entrenched. May we always be open to new ideas. May we never fear the challenges brought by new people, because their insights might surprise us and inspire us to try new things. May we always seek your guidance and be alert to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and minds, O Lord. Lead us forward. Lord Jesus, we pray for your world. Our age-old conflicts continue to fuel wars in Ukraine, the Middle East, and elsewhere. Our conflict between individuals and groups with different ways and ideas has never been greater. We pray for openness of heart, mind and spirit in order to find solutions to, able, to enable peace and harmony. Meanwhile, may the hungry be fed, the sick receive the care they need, and the grieving be comforted. May the humanity shown in acts of bravery, self-sacrifice and kindness in these troubled times and places continue to surprise us, O Lord. Open our hearts and minds, O Lord, lead us forward. 
Lord, we pray for our own community, especially for any new neighbours who have come among us this week. May we welcome them with open hearts, minds and doors, and encourage the contributions they bring. Lord, we pray for all who are sick in body, mind or spirit, for all who lack shelter or food or other basic necessities of life. And we pray for all those who seek to help them, especially those who explore new ways to ensure better lives where all needs are met. Guide and inspire them, Lord, in their scientific endeavour or their policy making or in whatever field they labour to improve the lot of those in need. May we always be amazed by what can be achieved. Open our hearts and minds, O Lord, lead us forward. And in the silence we bring the prayers of our own hearts to you. God, we thank you that you hear our prayers. Open all our hearts and minds, O Lord, and lead us forward. Amen. You're very welcome to stay behind for a coffee and tea after the service, and next Sunday will be our Christian aid service. So if at that point you've already received an envelope, then you can bring it along. You can use the e-envelope, uh, but it will be two Sundays to hand the envelopes in. We're going to sing our final hymn, 623, Here in this place, new light is streaming.
been gathered in and now you are sent out to be ready to welcome those who God is searching for. Go with the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Thank you.